Uh, so thanks for, for uh, coming, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've come to about five of these talks, and I've really enjoyed them, and uh, especially getting to know some other faculty in a way that you normally wouldn't get to know them. And I think it's built the sense of community here uh, for me at UCI. And I have an interesting story about that, which is that I was on a grant review panel, and I was reviewing grants for a family foundation in Southern California, and they give out grants just to um, professors in Southern California. And we were at a hotel in Pasadena reviewing the applications, and one came up from a UCI professor, and they all kind of turned to me and said, you know, do you know this person? And um, it took a second, but it triggered, and I had gone to the what matters, his, his what matters to me and why talk. And so um, I said, yeah, I actually, I know him actually really well. <laughs> <laughs> In, a, in that kind of weird dynamic that happens after these talks. So, um, so I explained to the review panel how I respected his integrity, how he'd overcome adversity. Um, he had great passion for his work and he was, he was very articulate. And he got the grant. <laughs> so hopefully um, there are a few people here who are gonna be reviewing my grants. <laughs> <clears throat> but if not, um, I'm still glad you're here and um, so thanks to the organizers, especially the previous speakers, um, whoever nominated me, and then to you. And then also, you're next. I want to hear what matters to you and why, whether it's up here or over coffee, or, or you know, you're next. OK, so um, what matters to me? What matters to me and why besides what matters to me and why? Sir, the, the series. And uh, I began uh, writing this talk last December. and. Um, I, so I'd thrown, I threw out my back, and I do that about once a year, and I do, you know, I bend over some way or have some weird movement off my bike, and I, get, I go into this alternate state of being where I can't really move without pain. And so I just have to calculate everything and pretty much stay flat for, when I was younger, maybe one or two days. Now it's like a week, I gotta stay flat. And uh, so when I was starting to write this, I said, you know, the thing that matters to me a lot is being able to move. And, and that, in fact, is what I study in my research as John um, described. Um, so I thought I'd kind of start just by explaining a little bit about my research and, and my, my uh, passion for that. So, um, so the question I asked is how do people move and how does the brain control muscles to allow us to do all the things we do? And I think this is one of the most fundamental questions in science and, and in neuroscience. And um, I have a few quotes from some, uh, that I'd like to read you. So one's from a, a current colleague, John Krakauer, and he says, plants don't have nervous systems because they don't go anywhere. So you gotta think about that one, so. <clears throat> and then another older scientist, this is a quote I really like that I read in grad school. Uh, Whoever has seen a startled deer in the forest and seen its harmonious movements can scarcely withheld, withhold a feeling of admiration. For behind it is a creative power of neural machinery whose exploration provides a tempting and almost presumptuous problem. So I like that, tempting and presumptuous problem to study movement. And then another old scientist, Sherrington, who said, in felling a forest or whispering a syllable, all we can do is move. And for that, the sole executant is muscle. So um, movement is really fundamental to who we are as people, and I find that really fascinating and challenging to study that. And then importantly, I'm an engineer too, so I wanna take what we learned studying movement and use it to try to help people. And um, so we make these exoskeletons and wearable sensors um, for people with stroke and spinal cord injury. So the T-Rex the thing, i I'll just tell you about that briefly, uh, that was mentioned in, the, in the, my bio. So that uh, was a project um, that was driven by Robert Sanchez, who is a PhD student in my lab. And uh, so when a person has a stroke, um, sometimes the, uh, it affects them so much they, they, they just can't lift their arm against gravity. And if that happens, um, people just stop using the arm because it's so difficult to do anything with it. So the idea there was to make a, um, an exoskeleton and it has springs. We worked with a guy named Terry Cromon from Delaware who developed this for children. But it, can, it makes your arm feel like it's, like it's floating. And then you can detect, and then we have a grip sensor where you can detect even small amounts of grip force and we created like virtual environments where the person can then start training. And um, so we asked one person, you know, and so people really liked it. And it, we got better results than um, just kind of conventional um, rehabilitation therapy. Um, so one of, my, uh, one of the volunteers in our study 
He said, you know, if I can't do something once, why would I do it 100 times? And so what we're trying to do is just give someone the ability to do it, do it, do it so they can keep practicing and stimulate their plasticity in their, in their brain. Um, so um, that matters to me. Um, I, you, know, so we had, you know, we had the idea, Robert Sanchez was just amazing at implementing it, and then this company had to commercialize it, and that whole process uh, of seeing it actually get out and be useful to people has really mattered, mattered to me. All right, so if you're curious about where we're trying to head with the exoskeletons, it's not Terminator or Robocop, but a better example from Hollywood would be um, the Dr. Dre video, uh, I Need a Doctor. And uh, so um, it's a Dr. Dre and Eminem. And so if you want to see like, where we're trying to head with our research, look at that video. And uh, there might be some objectionable language in it, but it's actually really, it's, it's, really uh, it's really actually quite artistic. And they actually used one of our robots just for like three seconds. Um, so it's a story of someone who's in a car accident, uh, Dr. Dre, and becomes uh, paralyzed. And then he receives something like stem cell therapy, it seems like. In the, and, um, and then he gets some movement back, and then he trains in our robot, and then soon he's like dipping 400 pounds in the, in the weight room after, after, after that. But that's what we're after. So we're working with stem cell biologists uh, tr to try to enhance re uh, regeneration with re rehabilitation. All right, so, um, so for, the, for the rest of the talk then, I thought I'd, I'd tell you how I got here doing this sort of thing. And um, so I'm going to identify several other things that matter to me besides movement. And I'm going to use some words that make sense to me, but you're going to have to figure it out. So the words are um, the lateral, the friend, and the wild. And these are the things that um, I really like and uh, bring me the deepest satisfaction. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll just talk a little bit about the why. Because I think it's interesting to try to talk about why do these things matter to me. So. All right, so um, the lateral, uh, so I just want to be aware, oh, there's, there's the clock, okay. Um, so the lateral, um, so I can trace my current job back to th uh, at least third grade. And um, I had this awesome teacher, <laughs> Carol DeWaskin. And uh, she, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and that's a city of about 300,000 people. And that's uh, so a little bit bigger than Irvine. And, uh, she was, Mrs. Dwoskin was excellent at stimulating creativity. And so I remembered one assignment she had us write, and it was about what we, we would, you know, what, what will you be doing as an adult? And my friend and I were absolutely sure that we'd have a koala bear farm in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I mean by the lateral. So it's the lateral thought, subversive paradigm, the alternate view. view. And it's the movement of your mind out of a track uh, into a different way of viewing things. And, it, and, and doing things. And then in the words of a favorite poet of mine, Gerard Manley Hopkins, it's all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. Um, so Mrs. Dwoskin also ran an invention contest and um, I created some sort of marble game, but after that I, would, I just, I loved it. And from there I wanted to be an inventor. And so even through my high school years, I, I, um, I uh, made games, like board games. Um, I made these like toys, mechanical toys that had like weird things like a dog, you would pull its tongue and its ears would go up or um, you, these mechanically kind of robotic toys. And I, um, and I made my own computer games. And I, liked, I gave, went to the talk from Paul Durish in uh, ICS here, and he said like, you know, he was old enough so that back in the day when you turned on the computer, all you could do was program it. That was it, that was the only option. <laughs> and uh, that's, that was my generation too. So you, TRS-80, or TI-40 I had, and you turned it on and I made the awesome game Loop-de-Loo, where you steer a plane around a maze, and, and uh, it was addictive back then as well, so. <laughs> So uh, Mrs. Dwoskin also had us write poetry, and uh, she was so excited by a poem I wrote that she had me actually go out of the class, take it to the first grade class, and read it to her friend, the teacher there. And so, um, that, so that, that's, you know, I, I still write poetry, and um, I like art, and uh, so I'd like to thank Mrs. Dwoskin for, for nurturing that. All right, so, that, so that's the lateral. <clears throat> Next, the friend. 
Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that relationships are basically what make life meaningful. In fact, when life gets tough, um, in the words of a mentor of mine, run to relationships. And so, so that's, uh, that's how it is with me. So my wife, Andrea, is here. And, uh, <laughs> and I, have my, I have my kids, um, Will, Anna, and Luke, acknowledging my parents and my brother, his family, my extended family, and then my colleagues here in engineering in the medical school and the staff I work with in undergrads I get to teach. Um, but I especially want to mention my grad students, some of who are up here. And uh, <clears throat> I've had 16 PhD students. And these are the people I get to work with for a number of years, ranging from four to maybe five, six, sometimes you know, it gets longer. <laughs> but it, I get to know them really well. And um, it's been one of the greatest privileges and joys in my, my job is to be able to work with and mentor them. And so hopefully I can be like Mrs. Dewaskin to them. Uh, <laughs> All right, so um, this kind of centrality of friendship in my life and the need for me to run to relationships is, I think I learned that in junior high. And uh, it was in that time in kind of adolescence, I, I had um, like a really severe anxiety thing. And um, I grew up um, Lutheran, which has a lot of, uh, and my dad actually still spoke German as his first language growing, growing up on his farm uh, in, in Illinois. But, um, it has a lot of beauty in it, and it was stable and comforting, but I was not very relationally connected uh, at the church. So across um, uh, the street from where I lived was a uh, Presbyterian church, and my brother had started going to a youth group there. And um, so I thought, well, you know, if this is something that is, uh, matters in my life, then um, I sh maybe should check that out. And uh, it's kind of ironic because... Um, you know, uh, so the Presbyterians were the more expressive thing because they're known in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Christianity as uh, the frozen chosen. It's kind of the, <laughs> so you could, so I went to the frozen chosen and, uh, <clears throat> but it, it turned out the youth group was really fun and I made new friends. And I think when I look back um, and I got out of that, that kind of anxiety attack thing. And um, so I think it was that caring community but also my acceptance that there was something bigger than me in my life um, that's worth exploring and something in the, in the universe that cares for me. And so that's the friend. It's the people around me who care for me and who I care for and my friends <coughs> and my colleagues and my student and it's God. And so they all matter to me. All right, so with the mention of God, I, I, I quickly want to say that I don't really see religion as something where it's just like keeping the rules. That's, that's not what I see or something I, I do to control God or um, control my life. Um, for me, it's primarily an intimate relationship with Christ. And um, it's, an ex it's initiated by an experience of forgiveness for breaking the rules. Um, so I had agree, I, I was recently reading a book um, by an atheist, Curtis White, who says, um, quote, and I agree with this, I am an atheist. If to be an atheist means not believing in a CEO God who sits outside his creation, proclaiming edicts, punishing hapless sinners, seeking vengeance on his enemies, and picking sides in times of war. So I, I'm an atheist in that sense. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm deeply religious and um, in the sense of seeking something that's profoundly mysterious, intellectually stimulating, and life-giving. And uh, something that if you stop and let it, its beauty works its way into you. So I'll tell you a quick story then about that, kind of to illustrate it, and it's a bit of a confession. So it's how my friends and I burnt down a uh, Presbyterian youth camp, part of it. <laughs> so, or just part of it. Uh, so, um, so we, my friends and I, um, we made, um, just for, you know, because I don't know why, but we made a, explosives out of uh, gunpowder from my friend's shotgun, dad's shotgun shells. And you could, we packed them into uh, film canisters, and then we had Estes model rocket lighters. And so we could, during our free time at the camp, uh, we would bury them, and then you could light them, and they'd blow dirt up in the air like uh, 30 feet. And so um, while we're doing this, then uh, we also were smoking grass. And um, 
in, in Kansas back in the day, that's actually literally grass. Okay, so. <laughs> So that's literally little dried weeds that we were picking up and lighting and then trying to see if we could blow smoke rings with. And they, they kept blowing out, or they kept going out. So we had the lateral thought uh, that we should make a small fire on the ground. And so that's one of the lateral thoughts that did not work out. <laughs> and so um, it caught on a tree and then it just spread to this whole field. So we just panicked and we ran, there was a lake near, nearby, so we ran to the lake got our shirts off, got them wet, came back, started beating it. And pretty soon the whole camp was there. Um, they were, we were, were probably 50 miles from a fire, fire truck. So, um, they, so the whole camp was there beating it out. And it burnt down this whole meadow, but it fortunately did not spread to the surrounding forest, which we attributed to a um, shift in the wind. So I remember um, standing with my, with my head hung low, apologizing in front of the whole camp. Um, and that was a terrifying experience, but out of it, I experienced forgiveness. And that didn't, uh, they didn't kick us out, so they didn't kick us out of the camp, and they, and they in fact acted like it never happened. And uh, so you can probably understand what I'm talking about if you've um, hurt someone, and then you've been restored, and how that can make you a creative person again. And so that's the sort of friendship that matters to me. Okay, so the third thing is the wild. <clears throat> the wild. Uh, so think about the burning meadow I just told you about. So why, why didn't I want the meadow to burn? And why was the, what was the value of the field to everyone there? Why did it matter? And you know, it was beautiful and it was a sanctuary as all the wild places in the world are. And that's what I call the wild. You could also call it nature or the environment, but I don't like those terms. And I'm not alone. Uh, uh, Gary Paulson, uh, for example, an author, calls it the woods. But I, in Kansas, there weren't that many woods, so that doesn't work. And uh, another author I like is Wendell Berry, and he doesn't like the term environment. He calls it um, because he says the word environment means our surroundings, and, action, and our actual relationship with the world is much more intimate. Um, so in any case, I started to love the, the wild from a very young age. And in Wichita, I lived across from these large fields. And there was this uh, big, we call it the big tree. And behind it was a creek. And we, my brother and I, we'd go climb the tree and play in the creek for hours. And I was involved in 4-H. And um, I was in photography club at 4-H. And I, I was the person known as the guy who takes abstract pictures of trees. And I just love you know, <laughs> lying underneath trees, taking pictures of their fractal you know, limb structure, and, uh, and, I, and I really like the, the idea of um, the Ents in the Lord of the Rings movies, or the books. Oh, yeah. And so they, 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 um, they kind of per personify ancient wisdom and power, and yet they're vulnerable. And so for me, um, it's the wild that I go to for inspiration, adventure, and, and peace. So when my son Will turned 13 uh, a year ago, we, um, it was natural to market with a trip into the wild, an adventure in the wild. And we hiked the Grand Canyon uh, in and out in a day, which is about an 18 mile deal. And uh, we started in the dark. And you know, as, as we start, uh, you can see people ahead of us with the headlamps, kind of like the stream of lights going down. And then as we, as we came in about an hour, the sun came up and just the beauty of that. Um, and we were with my, one of my best friends, Chad, and his son, Caleb. It was just unbelievably beautiful, heart achingly awesome. So the wild really matters to me. And I'm really proud to be at UCI because um, we have a lot of colleagues here who are working to understand it and protect it and sustain it and help it to flourish. So, um, so the wild. Okay, so those, those are the three things that matter to me. So I, I thought then I'd finish just by asking the why question. And um, why, why do these things I've told you, um, movement, the lateral, the friend, and the wild, why, why do they matter to me? And I've kind of told you some of the reasons already. Um, like, movement's really fascinating to me. It's also something where I feel like can, I can study it to help people. Um, the wild, it's beautiful, it's a sanctuary. Uh, but I want to go a little bit deeper on it. And first, you know, why, I think it's, it's a really difficult question. <laughs> And I think we all struggle with answering it, and I struggle with it too. 
And um, in fact, that was the most challenging thing about this, is trying to think about the why part. The what matters to me part, okay. The why part is much more difficult. <clears throat> Second, I want to recognize there are different approaches to understanding why. Um, so as a scientist, um, I could say that my appreciation for such things I've told you um, likely contributed to fitness or flourishing and evolution of the human species. And that's why they matter to me, and that would be true in a sense. Or as a neuroscientist, I could say um, these things I've told you about, they cause an increased release of dopamine <laughs> and uh, reward-related uh, neurotransmitters in my brain, and that's why they matter to me. And that would be true also. However, um, as one of my favorite authors, Frederick Buechner says, you know, the, the scientific explanations, while important, they can be like a podiatrist describing the love of someone's life, who I'm gonna call Susie Smith. So, okay, so it's like the, a podiatrist describing the love of someone's life, Susie Smith. So the podiatrist says, Susie Smith has fallen arches. And the one who loves Susie Smith says, she walks in beauty like the night. And to quote Buechner, uh, in his own way, each is speaking the truth. What is at issue is the kind of truth you're after. So, uh, you know, in the kind of after the she walks in beauty like the night kind of truth, I think I believe these things matter to me because there is a genius that walks in beauty behind them who made me the way I am, and so they matter to me. And so, for example, on the lateral, the idea she walks in beauty like the night is the idea that God, God walks in beauty of imagination and creativity and makes me in his image to be lateral just as God is a lateral thinker. And in fact, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I think Jesus is the ultimate lateral thinker that I found in my ex, uh, explorations. And so the greatest challenge and encouragement into my life um, to think laterally. So a quick sample of why I say that. Um, he postulated your value isn't determined by your resume or your IQ, or your salary, or by how much power you have. Made the observation that your friend is, it could just be the possibly random person you just met, but who is in need, or even someone on the other side of the world. Hypothesize that you find your life by losing it, and you best use your power by serving. And contended that all people in our diversity are valuable and worth sacrificing for. And that bad can be turned into good, and eventually all will be well and all manner of things will be well. So again, uh, going back to Frederick Buechner, um, the genius, God, in his poet mo mode says, when you make discoveries like this, it's like finding a million dollars in a field or a jewel worth a king's ransom. It's like finding something you hated to lose and thought you'd never find again, an old keepsake, a stray sheep, a missing child. It's as if the thing you lost and thought you'd never find again is yourself. Um, so these, I, these kinds of ideas are unexpected and lateral to me. They're beautiful, but they ring true. They're beautiful, powerful, and they matter. And perhaps um, they help explain why I am the way I am, or at least the way I want to be. Okay, so then consider the friend. I told you, friend, why do relationships matter? So the she walks in beauty like the night idea here for me is that God walks in the beauty of relationships and makes me relational, therefore, in his image, to be loved and to love. And um, I read a short essay by Amy Tan, uh, the Joy Luck Club author, and it was on a Chipotle bag. If you, you guys don't go to Chipotle, I just saw this last week, but I like the, they're putting these authors, they're writing things. And, <clears throat> and so it was on ghosts, and, and she believes in ghosts, and she's had ghosts, you know, uh, interactions with them that have been inspiring to her and ghost of her mother for example and she said on the bag um, that happenstance can have meaning and I and I think what she's meaning is that these everyday interactions that we have in her case it, it was the supernatural kind of thing but um, but everyday interactions bring meaning to our lives and that's what I believe too and that the relational coincidences in our lives um, cohere to form purpose and to form us so um, an analogy is like if you go play in the ocean here and you go and you're playing, splashing around for a while and um, then you look up to look, see your towel or whatever you left and you've like drifted down 200 feet, right? You've, if, you've done, if you play, you know that happens. And so that current, to me, it's like the people in my life. And um, so I think 
we all, when we look for meaning in our lives, we, we intuitively reflect on the singular people who've shifted uh, the direction of our lives. And to kind of support this from a research point of view, uh, there was a study recently published by um, Purdue and Gallup, and I think it's really encouraging to us at UCI. And the study was, they looked at several thousand people in, who were in their careers, later in life in their careers, and they, they wanted to see what mattered about their college experience uh, to them. And they, they, they wanted to say what mattered in terms of, are you in a job that you are engaged in? And are you in a job such that you're flourishing? And you're flourishing uh, intellectually, physically, emotionally. And um, they found that it did not matter if you went to a public or private school. It did not matter if you went to a small or large school if it was very selective or less selective. And, um, but the one thing that doubled your chance of flourishing in your career later was if you could answer yes to the following three questions. <clears throat> Number one, I had at least one professor who made me excited about learning. Number two, my professors cared about me as a person. And number three, I had a mentor who encouraged me to pursue my goals and dreams. So that doubles in this survey, double the chances. Uh, and so I think the time that we all spend mentoring here at UCI really seems to matter in the lives of our students, even though we might not realize it. And uh, so that's encouraging, I think, for, for what we do here. So finally, you know, what, what's, uh, what's the current of relational influence look like for me? So I'll just finish with this. So some of the things I already told you, and, I, and I'm gonna add a couple other things, just you know, as little factoids about me and as, I, as I go through this. So it's because um, Mrs. Dwoskin encouraged me that I'm here doing what I'm doing, and I love it. And it's because I walked across the street and found that youth group that I, I, my anxiety was eased and my uh, spiritual life opened up. It's my parents and their love for me and, they, and their encouragement for me to go to MIT even when I didn't even know what MIT was. <laughs> 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 and um, it's meeting a guy named Koichi, uh, my first day at MIT, who, um, uh, yeah, my first day, I met him. And then uh, Carl uh, and Mike, who became my diverse group of friends at MIT, uh, and made MIT an amazing and fun experience. And a great group of friends I met at Berkeley, and I lived in community, kind of like in a commune there, and we cooked for each other, studied our faith together, worked against homelessness, <clears throat> hiked together, found our vocations, and I met Andrea at, at Berkeley too. And uh, this current of relational influence also has had struggle aspects to it. Um, where it when I was in grad school, I just was struggling to find meaning to be a grad student. And I found, I changed advisors, and I found Steve Lehman, um, who was just a great advisor, who gave me freedom and support to do these kind of lateral things in my, my research. And also, um, my postdoc advisor, Zev Reimer, at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, who encouraged me to stick with and develop really what was a new field that no one was working in, and it really wasn't fashionable to be doing it. And then, you know, I struggled really to find a job. So, um, you know, I applied to many, many places and got many rejection letters. But then the UCI had a position in biorobotics and it was exactly where I wanted to live. My, my wife, Andrea, is from Pasadena and I love California uh, because of the wild. Uh, and uh, so that was, that, was, that was amazing. And getting, getting uh, then colleagues like Jim Bobro, who's here, uh, have had great colleagues and we've built some really cool robots together. Um, and then my grad students that I told you about, how important it's been to me. So that's, that's the current, current to me. <clears throat> so finally, all this has led me to this chance to be here at UCI. And uh, it's an amazing place to work. And I think by our mission of education, discovery, and mentoring, when we all work together to contribute to those things, we, we will further peace and knowledge and we'll help people. And the fact that I get to be part of that is uh, to quote immeasurably more than I can ask or imagine. So, thank you. So we have time for a few questions. So, anyone have a question? Okay. Have a question. What kind of camera did you use in the 4H? <laughs>
<laughs> That's a good question. It was it was ancient, definitely. Yeah, definitely ancient. I think it was black and white too. I remember I have a bunch of black. Well, the film was black and white, and they were like square. Might have been some of them might have been Polaroids actually. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hi, I'm curious about your poetry. Is there a particular subject that you like to write about? Or can you recite some? My wife. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I did not bring my poetry, and I'm not confident enough. I don't think, especially in this environment, <laughs> especially in this environment where there legitimately could be like an internationally known poet sitting here right now. Uh, but it's something I enjoy. You know, same with the art. I like to draw and paint. Uh, lately, it's kind of shifted more to photography, but uh, I, I enjoy that also. Well, I think what you're what you're talking about right now is that um, yeah. something that's really important, especially in environmental learning, is that we don't always have to do things to be the internationally acclaimed yeah. poet or yeah. artist. We can do it just because it fills us up and breathes life into us. Yeah. So that's awesome. So yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's a really good question. What do I share with my kids to encourage them to be creative? Um, well, first of all, like if they come up to me and they say I'm bored, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, good. yeah. And uh, I think my wife and I were always looking for opportunities for our kids to be creative, and um, we try to. And I mean, a really simple thing in our house is we try to limit media. And because the media is just so, um, I like it. It's entertaining. It's just, it's, um, but it's a, uh, you're a consumer. You're not generative with it. And uh, so we try to set up space, uh, spaces in our house and just time space where our kids can be creative. Um, and then we try to expose them to different, avenues of creativity, you know, let them try different things and just hope they find the thing that they're, that's they're passionate about. And right now, um, my youngest son, Luke, nine, and he's just writing, he's writing. He'll go in, wake up at 6 a.m. and go write for an hour. And he's writing a book, so he says a story. And uh, so that's like awesome to see that. And he has some great poetry, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they should have brought his poems. They're amazing. So, um, yeah, so I think those are the things that come to mind. So the exposure to a bunch of different things and then um, limiting the influence of, the, of I mean, we, we, we love to watch movies together and the kids get time to play video games and stuff like that. We just try to limit it. So. Dave, though, uh, this is Jack. Yeah, hey, Jack. <laughs> um, you also, though, you, you make up games and you play these games with them yeah. and, and you do these kinds of things, uh, creative things like you know, yeah. hide and go seek type of things and yeah. uh, writing things down and, and searching for them and these yeah. kinds of things that I've seen you do even with yeah. your kids. It's, it's very, totally creative yourself and then they have to make up part of the game too and everything. Yeah, yeah, like treasure hunts yes. and things like that or clues and yeah, right. yeah, we do that too. And then you yeah. take them out into the woods and, <laughs> and into the wild and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think getting out into the, into, into the, the wild is really good too for them yeah. in terms of the creativity and confidence. So, yeah. Yeah. Two questions. One, do you still keep in contact with the mentor, <clears throat> mentor, mentors that have really inspired you, like a third grade teacher? Oh. Two, yeah. as a professor now, do you have doubts about your faith? Okay. Um, do I, I haven't talked to Mrs. Dwoskin. Uh, <laughs> Since third grade. <laughs> so I feel bad about that. I know. Well, okay, so I, t in my defense, I moved, I moved away from Wichita, Kansas when I was a junior in high school. And I've only been back there once since then. So, and it was before, and I'm actually old enough before there was email. I know there was surface mail, so it's really no excuse, but uh, someone did give me an email address for her recently, so maybe I can email her my talk. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. 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 Um, other mentors I definitely keep in touch with, um, my graduate mentor, my postdoc mentor especially. Um, and so yeah, yeah, I definitely do. 
And uh, then the second question was, do I have doubt? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, I think that's, I mean, in a kind of paradoxical way, doubt is foundational to faith. Yeah. Um, my faith, I think, uh, questioning is part of it. I, I think it's encouraged by, by uh, in my faith to be, to question in a respectful way, but, you know, also in a, could be a passionate, emotional way, things are really crappy, you know, so, um, yeah, I definitely, definitely have things, and, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably the world of robotics and medicine is quite small. Uh, so have you had any contact or done anything with Dean Kamen? Oh, Dean Kamen. Um, let's see, Jim Bobro has a segue. So <laughs> I've, ridden, I've ridden on a segue. Um, I have not met Dean Kamen. Uh, I, I am aware of his recent work on the Luke arm. Uh, so the Luke arm, DARPA had a a, a uh, challenge, which was to create a robotic arm that was sort of like matched the capability of the human arm for a use by people with, uh, who've lost a limb. And he created the Luke arm, uh, which is um, after Star Wars. And uh, uh, so Luke, his father, Darth Vader, you know, labor, la uh, uh, cuts off his arm. Uh, and uh, so the idea was to make an arm. So Luke then gets the arm, and it's like, Shh. so. Uh, so there's some awesome video that, uh, that we look at. Actually, we looked at in my class. We talked about it today, actually, in my class in biorobotics, where people are now able. There was kind of this holy grail to do a multifunctional or multi-degree freedom uh, prosthetic hand that was sensate. And so now you you were people. There's something like that where you can have this complicated arm and. It has artificial sensors, and when you touch it, you feel it. Like it either maps into your nerves or, or onto your, your skin somewhere, and uh, you feel it. So anyway, that's kind of a long answer, but you could, I, you could tell I like that, like that stuff. So, no, I, I have not met him, yeah, but yeah, I know his work, and it's really cool. So, you know, it's interesting with the prosthetic arms, too, like, they, yeah, well, nah, forget it. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't get me started. So. <laughs> Yes, he had the insulin pump thing too, right? So, yeah. Yeah. A great lateral thinker. Mm -hmm. So, following up, hey Dave. Um, I like the lateral part. Um, just wondering, uh, when you're a kid, you can have all these lateral thoughts and do something about it because you're limited in, in resources and you have a lot of time at your hand. Um, and you're, at, you know, at this stage in your life, uh, when you have these lateral thoughts, then you're confined a lot by your job, by your time and availability. And so sometimes, how do you kind of deal with that in terms of letting yourself be satisfied with all the lateral thoughts that in, inventive and creative, but you can only pursue one or two or maybe even none? Um, yeah. Kind of, how, how do you deal with that? How do I deal with that? Yeah. Um, maybe, no, I, 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 that there's a, a lot of pressure. Uh, a feeling, you know, like having too many things to do and just like the huge email queue or whatever. And I think that cuts into the time to be creative. I think for me though, um, working with my students gives, they have ideas, I have ideas, we have this interplay with each other. And uh, um, so that, that's, that's a primary way to do it. Um, my students probably have learned that they've they can't listen to everything I say. <laughs> so, like, I keep having suggestions or whatever, but they gotta, you know, cut it off, focus it. And, uh, yeah, so I think the interplay for me, primarily, and, and that's an awesome thing about being a professor, is you get that, that lateral interplay with, the stu with your students, you know. So, um, One is three hundred fifty dollars. So, uh, do you have any plans to sort of 
open up your work to the large collaboration or something that would reduce the cost? Yeah, that's an interesting issue. Um, yeah, so with the uh, T-Rex I told you back, the arm exoskeleton that's commercial, we do have a patent on it. It's owned by UC Irvine. And they license, UC Irvine license it to the Swiss company that commercializes it. So we get a royalty on sales of um, the device that, in the US only, because the patent only covers the US. Um, the market for these thing, types of devices is fairly like small. It's like a developing market. And so one thing I've learned um, is that in order for you to get a technology that you've invented or helped invent out, people have to be able to like have a livelihood with it, right? So, um, so you have to set up, if, if there's actually gonna be like support for it and the availability to purchase it, you have to have like a way to make some profit or something that supports the people in the company that are making it. Um, so for that reason, I would say in this type of device, I don't see it as something like uh, uh, open source at this point, um, maybe later. And then um, we are working, we do have a device though that we, we were challenged by the founder of Free Wheelchair Mission, who's a guy in Orange County um, who invented a $80 wheelchair. And um, he estimates the worldwide need for people uh, who can't afford a wheelchair but need one is about 100 million people. And he, um, he came and saw like one of our million dollar robots and he said like, oh, wouldn't you, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed. And he's like, wouldn't you be great? Wouldn't it be great if you could take what you've learned from that and apply it to a device that could be used anywhere? And so I am interested in that. And we, and we came up with a device that's it's, it's just a lever that you attach to a wheelchair. Uh, and you, you rock yourself in it. And through that, you get arm rehabilitation exercise. And we had a physical therapy professor take it to, um, from uh, Northridge. CSU Northridge took it to Vietnam. Uh, over January to test it at a clinic in Vietnam. Uh, we've also tech, uh, tested it in Mexico City. Um, so that kind of thing, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in having that be sort of more like that, that model. Yeah, thanks. One more question. I got it, here we go. Dave, could you just tell us about the wheelchair project? We've heard so much. Some of us have heard so much yeah. about it, and you're so modest. You didn't tell us hardly anything about the wheelchair. Oh, about the wheelchair. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of. I mean, my 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 wheel. Well, I have a couple wheelchair projects, but the one I'm I'm really excited about right now is what I just told you, which is that we have a a way that um, I'll tell you a little bit more. So we found that people who are very very paralyzed after a stroke, so their arms are kind of like this. They can barely touch your chin, and they're they're taught that they can't. They can't, they can't use a manual wheelchair while they're in the hospital. And so they, they go around with one arm and one leg. And that just contributes to the, uh, the problem with the arm because if you don't use it, you lose it. It's, so your plasticity kind of degrade, or there's a negative cycle in the, in the plasticity. And so what we found though is we, if we give them the right levers and leverage, uh, and we take away the requirement that they have to grip the push rim, that people, we've had about 20 people do this now, but they can actually uh, by, by manually ambulate in a manual wheelchair. And so um, we're really excited about that. And it's really striking because it, it's like a case where a person with a disability was, was told like, you can't do this. It was just the assumption you can't do it. But really it was just having the right tool and you could do it. And uh, so we think that that's gonna be, in every, it should be in every hospital in the world that when people have a stroke, they should not be being pushed around. They should be self auto ambulating with this by manual drive. And uh, we, we're waiting to hear for, we have a, a possible grant to try to commercialize that we're waiting to hear on right now. Um, and uh, I'd love to see a model like Tom's shoes. I think Tom's where you buy a pair and you get, they get, give a pair, you know, that would be a great model. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's, that's what I'm excited about in the wheelchair domain right now. Thanks. Yeah. More questions? Thank you very much. Please uh, join me. Thank you.